Hey everyone, welcome to episode 25 of Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Let's jump right back into it, finish off second edition. Death of the Dragon, talking about the uh, Koromira novel, it's kind of part three of that series of events or whatever. I tried reading book one and I tried reading book two and I didn't like either of them, so I just did not bother with book three. Figured, you know, it's gonna be more of the same. I know that apparently this is like the big thing that happens here is Azun dies. I think he dies fighting a dragon. They might kill each other. Yeah, and, and so that's a huge deal, but um, I don't wanna wade through a book that I'm not going to enjoy just to to get to that. So, uh, so yeah, um, again, big kind of clearing the plate for 3rd edition. Like, 3rd edition, it's weird because 3rd edition really doesn't feel like tons has changed overall, uh, except for the big thing, which, you know, we'll get back to here uh, before long. Oh, which I, I did want to mention that about the Wizard War. That's another thing that happens in the Wizard War is the Shadow Weave gets mentioned and introduced and I think, I could be wrong, but I think Counselors and Kings technically came out in 3rd edition, uh, during 3rd edition's time. Like, I, I am sure that uh, the Hunter's Blades trilogy did. Who knows, Shadow Weave might even get uh, offhandedly mentioned in there. But I think it's interesting that they kind of went in and retrofitted in Shadow Weave stuff. And Sorcerers. Sorcerers are mentioned in this, as well as the Shadow Weave. I'm trying to remember if in uh, City of Ravens, if they mention the Shadow Weave, there's definitely an explanation for how Sorcerers exist, which I thought was kind of cool, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's not something that, like, oh, they have to pull off of this source. No, it's just, like, the source is there, and it's like, okay, cool, because uh, it, it doesn't really affect anybody's game. If somebody wanted to play some crazy thing where somebody destroyed that source, you possibly could, I think. I can't remember the details of how they uh, worked it enough to know if that would work, but it's maybe possible. So yeah, I, I, I gotta admit, I find it fun how the Shadow Weave is uh, becoming a thing and it's it's being mentioned more and it feels like it could be something that becomes more important. And obviously, at least with the Archwizards trilogy, after that, I don't know, it might just never get mentioned at all, but at least with the Archwizards trilogy, it's gonna play a huge, huge part. And they kind of offhandedly mentioned it in Wizard War, which is fine because it, um, it it's not really about that and it doesn't get used that much. It almost feels as if somebody told Elaine after she had finished a first draft, by the way, could you fit in maybe some shadow magic stuff in here? And she was like, eh, all right. Uh, somebody offhandedly mentions, you know, like, it's said that you can kind of go crazy if you pull off of it too much. And the guy's like, dude, I'm doing one spell. And he's like, oh yeah, I guess, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it really feels as if this is something that's becoming more important going to play out in a, in a bigger way here uh, coming up. Shadow's Witness by Paul S. Kemp. We finally get to talk about Paul S. Kemp. Very exciting. He is one of the things that got me back into reading the realms and made me think this whole idea was not as crazy <laughs> as it might first seem. So let me just first say that I absolutely love Paul Kemp and Shadow's Witness is definitely not bad, but little tip for you, do not read Shadow's Witness after you have read Twilight Falling, which is the first of his Erebus Kale trilogy, because it shares many things in common. And I wouldn't say that stuff in here is spoiled, because it's not really like about spoiling, it's about uh, many things in here he kind of refines in Twilight Falling. I felt in a lot of ways like I was reading the same novel, just not quite as well formed. I wouldn't say skip this because it has some amazing moments in it. I don't want to say this is an amazing moment because it really isn't. It's such a small moment, but we get to see Jack leave the Harpers and why it happens. It felt really underwhelming to me since, you know, uh, in Twilight Falling, it's like they talk about how he's an ex-Harper and everything. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And it's really not that interesting. So, you know, again, it's like, there are these kind of frustrating things, and then seeing Jack, like, do his, like, thief thing to his goddess at the beginning just feels like it goes on forever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are just a lot of things here that feel slow because there's payoff to the things that are set up once we get to Twilight Falling, and Twilight Falling just feels like a much more... I don't want to use the word lean again because I used it earlier when talking about crime novels, but it, it definitely feels like it's it's chugging a lot faster. Like, this feels like it has about three events and then an awesome climax, whereas Twilight Falling feels like it's, like, 
almost no events like it's 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 two minor events it's it's and then an awesome climax but there's so much going on inside Erebus's ca Erebus's head that's really interesting it just makes it feel like it goes a mile a minute the climax is great it has one of the most beautifully awesome cinematically interesting moments ever which is basically like there's this uh, you know and it's been so long since i've read this i'll admit that i'm probably misremembering it totally but trust me when i say it's awesome and basically it consists of like erebus and jack are climbing across this wall because there's this uh gap in the floor and they they realize that the gap in the floor is this portal to the abyss and they don't want to fall into it because then they're going to be in the abyss or, or some dark demi plane i mean it's, it's bad right it's another plane and it's bad while uh, i think it's either after one of them's gotten across or while they're both halfway across this like demon thing comes out of i can't remember what it was was it a dragon a evil wyvern or demon thing i don't know whatever it comes like flying out of it and goes after him and basically Erebus just is like screw it and just like jumps on it knives out and just takes it down into the abyss and i'm like that is awesome like that's just such a great moment it's just such a you know i mean salvatore has done similar things in driz don't get me wrong but kemp wrote it in such a way that it just feels like holy shit our main character just died <laughs> what are we gonna do for the rest of this like uh not uh sextet i guess because there's a trilogy but then a trilogy that follows pretty much right after that you know what, what are we gonna do now erebus is obviously dead and this is even time-wise i think before his short story that appears in halls of storm weather so yeah uh but uh no he they basically go through the whole thing where you know they'd killed this thing well it wasn't the same thing obviously but they kill this thing on the material plane and then it has a hundred years before it could come back and then basically they both end up in the abyss and they're like well screw it as long as we're here let's just go kill this thing for real and i'm just like this is awesome like basically the last third or so like essentially act three is amazing in this book uh and then even the epilogue is really good because we get the hints of what's going on with what's his name uh revan raven uh something like that and uh again that's more like played out once we get to the Erebus Kale trilogy which also has a lot of stuff to do with Mask. Obviously, you probably guessed that even if you hadn't read it by the fact that Mask is in the title. Which, Erebus is a Mask worshiper. You know, which seems just really odd to me because at this point I thought Mask was a really, really, uh, if e either minor deity or enveloped within Cyric's, uh domain. Domain, uh, whatever the right term there would be. And uh, I thought that in Prince of Lies or crucible that mask we'd found out that that one sword was masked and he was basically like stripped of his godhood but i i maybe i'm getting things mixed up because they're worshiping masks and they get spells from mask here so obviously mask must be a bigger player than i realized not sure if you know the later erebus books might delve into that but in any case just a really fascinating uh read here and really good to see some of the grayer sides of things played with and not in a way that's horrible like with red magic by rob or rabe but in a way that's really interesting erebus kale is a fascinating character absolutely love erebus kale and revan raven though though he's a lot more two-dimensional in this book and jack as well i mean a fallen harper you know we've had a lot of fallen harpers but they are all pretty much the same and i, I guess honestly jack is too he just you know wants to do good still blah 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 blah, blah. but that's okay i mean I'm okay with Fallen Harpers still essentially being Harpers at heart. It makes sense. So, yeah, if, if you have read the other Erebus Kale stuff, don't bother going back and reading this because it's going to be kind of a letdown. But if you haven't, start here. You will not be disappointed. If you're a little disappointed, go ahead and check out the uh, Erebus Kale trilogy because it gets so much better. City of Splendors, a Waterdeep novel by Elaine Cunningham and Ed Greenwood. What's interesting here is, wow, can you tell which sections uh, were written by whom? Because certain sections will be uh, readable, <laughs> essentially, and then other sections will be like, tis a fine day, twirrit not twiddly dee, do de do de do and ah, oh, it makes me want to put a gun in my mouth. I just cannot stand that. And then other sections are like, you know... Bob digested the difficulty of the problem ahead of him. Da, 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 da. You know, it just feels written rather than kind of spewed out by some mad typist in a cabin alone going, hee hee hee, as they write. Which, 
I, you know, I totally picture it being how Greenwood writes. And I'm cool with that, and I'm glad people enjoy it. Certainly not me. So I, I got through, I, I got a ways into this. Some of the ideas are really fun. I mean, y you have this guy who's, like, trying to, like, uh, kind of Frankenstein's monster himself in order to become immortal. You have this, these, uh, guys who are like just playing at being a uh, an adventuring party they're just kind of bored nobles and that's fun that's like an idea you don't see but it just felt like it wasn't going anywhere so i started skimming and then i just gave up also i swear i had read somewhere that elaine's character that elf dude who uh was in the elf song series i swear that somebody had said that like he played a big part in this i didn't see him and i read a good hundred pages i think so yeah, if he's in there somewhere, somebody let me know what happens with him because I didn't see him and I didn't feel like there was anything added to that. And yeah, it just, it was pretty dull, I guess. Uh, I don't even remember. I think I got at least to the point where kind of the plot kicks in and I don't even remember what it was. That's how kind of eh it was for me. So yeah, skipping that. <laughs> Let's end in 1372, the year of wild magic. That's right, this is the year that everything hits the fan and we go to third edition. Not everything hits the fan. It's really not that huge of a change in a lot of ways. But we start getting really good covers. <laughs> that's something that's really nice about third edition is that suddenly this is going to look much nicer and people are going to actually start watching these because the covers are much nicer. Pool of Twilight. The last of the pool series. I seriously don't know why three and four seem to be switched on the chronology I'm using. I couldn't find anything that like said it was one way or, or the other. I, I I don't know. Uh, it's it's they mentioned that it's been quite a long time since the first two books. That's for sure. This was such a cool way to end out second edition. This book because in so many ways we got to see kind of the end of an era with it. We bring back Miltiades, the undead paladin. We bring back most of our characters from the first two pools book. We have a couple of them die or have, you know, they're they're kind of they're they're beyond their prime. They're the backup characters now. And instead it's this new generation and they're passing the torch and it feels like in a lot of ways this is a metaphor for the entire realm's history at this point this is a you know the the entire realm's fiction line at this point everything which is odd because i don't think this book was actually written right at the time that the third edition stuff was coming out but maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm just assuming that because it has kind of a cheesy cover but yeah it it, it really just feels like the end of an era it's it, the writing style is kind of somewhere between the first two pools book and a third edition book it's not as simplistic as the old stuff but it's definitely not as complex and character driven as the newer stuff. The plot is pretty straightforward and there are no real surprises to it, but it was it was enjoyable. It was it was nice to see everything that had had a meaning way back at the beginning of this stuff kind of come together here at the end as well. Um I really really felt like this worked as a good coda to second edition in a lot of ways and i cannot believe we have actually made it through it obviously i've skipped quite a few of the books i don't even want to like look at a percentage because i'm afraid that it might be much higher than i thought it was but we've made it through all of second edition now how crazy is that and we are ready for third edition next time and like i did with the avatar trilogy i'm going to try to take a look at like did second edition feel as a whole it kind of there are some weird bits because there are some third edition in there and vice versa but you know it it it, it essentially it's all going to even out and I'm going to ask you know uh, does the arch wizard trilogy and i guess i'll include elminster and hell there even if i do end up skipping it i'm going to at least give it a shot you know those four books do they kind of make it feel like we're introduced to a new world it's the same but slightly different etc 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 we'll ask all those questions next time but for now i think we are good and i will see you i'm guessing in probably a few months so yeah uh everybody thank you so much for being along for the ride so far uh i have really enjoyed everybody's comments even the people who disagree with me you know i nobody's been mean and even if you're mean i don't care i mean it's a you know it's book reviews but the uh <laughs> i i feel like everybody's uh been having a good time and we're enjoying this and I am really excited to be excited about everything again 
at some point, just not so much right now. But yeah, I'm going to take a breather, come back with uh, Troy Denning, I believe his final uh, foray into the realms. Who knows, though? Maybe we'll get him back. We can hope, right? I'm guessing Star Wars must pay a hell of a lot better. But yeah, we'll come back with Troy Denning's final entry into the realms and kick off lots and lots of books about Sembia, from what I can tell. And we will, uh, yeah, we'll do that at some point in the near future. So hey everybody, thanks for sticking around. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.